Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today we are covering lesson number 11 about the brain. Friendly reminder that this is the third and final lesson that we have in unit number three. The unit number three exam opens up on Monday morning, so we are just about there. Review session for that exam tomorrow, Friday, as well as on Monday, the first day that it's open. So keep in mind that the unit number three exam and all of those unit number three assignments are all coming due as we, we get to this point in the semester. To help us with our discussion of the brain today, we did a little bit of review from lab. So I gave us a picture here of a very simplified brain and I asked us with our groups to label the following structures on here. So what I want to do to help us uh, make it as easy as possible here is we'll kind of go from color to color or kind of region of the brain to different region. We're going to start here with my blue colored region up here. This is one of my lobes of the brain. Which lobe of the brain did we see here in blue? What lobe was this first one? Yeah, exactly. This lobe here in the front of the brain is the frontal lobe of the brain. If you were struggling a little bit to orient yourself, remember that the structure we can use to help us determine front from back is actually this thing back here. What's this little thing back here that, that we see? This is actually is not a lobe of the brain. What brain structure is this one down here? Yeah, exactly. This one down here is the cerebellum, the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is something we'll talk about a little bit today, but I want to do a quick plug for your current events in anatomy. There are a couple of articles in that database about a, a woman who didn't find out until she was in her 20s that she didn't actually have a cerebellum. So if you're interested in finding out what life would be like without a cerebellum, check that out in the current events and anatomy article library there is yeah there's an article about her so very interesting she didn't know until she was in her 20s that she had no cerebellum i know now everyone in the chat is like what so I, I i can't ruin that experience for you you're gonna have to go read it for yourself it's actually a very interesting article it, it shows you fanchon asked how does she not know uh, it, it goes to show you that it, it's not something that you need to stay alive, but it is something that can have a big enough effect that eventually we can figure out you don't have it. So that's all I'll say. She did have some pretty significant uh, effects, but they didn't know she didn't have a cerebellum, which is what was causing them for quite a while in her life. So very interesting. When we talk about uh, identifying our parts of the brain, Right on top of the cerebellum, let's go to the, the pink one back here. We're back into the cerebrum. We're back into the brain itself. What lobe of the brain do we see back here labeled in pink? This pink red structure that we see. Yeah, exactly. This one back here is the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe. Remind me in the chat. Yeah, Kaylin beat me to it. Uh, the occipital lobe is, is the one that helps us with vision, right? So when we talk about the process of vision, you actually see here in front of the brain, and that information has to go all the way to the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. So vision happens in the back of the brain where we actually process it or, or do it, whereas the process of seeing things happens actually in the very front of the brain. A lobe of the brain that is much closer to where you'd expect for it to do things is this one over here. What is the name of this lobe here in green? My green lobe. Yeah, exactly. My green lobe over here is the one called the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe. The main thing that we remember the temporal lobe for is for the process of hearing, right? Uh, but there's actually another function it has as well. Do we remember from matching things up? Kind of a random function, actually. Did we figure out what that other one was? Yeah, exactly. So the temporal lobe primarily helps us with the sense of hearing, but it is also involved in the sense of smell, the temporal lobe. So that's this one here in your temples. 
And that leaves for us our last lobe of the brain that we can see on the outside. What's the name of our yellow lobe out here? Who lives, who lives here in kind of the back part of, of the brain? Yeah, exactly. That last lobe is called the parietal lobe, the parietal lobe. So parietal lobe in between the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe, kind of right next door to the temporal lobe here. The parietal lobe is one of my lobes of the brain that has one of these important bumps in it. When we talk about the parietal lobe, do we have the pre or post central gyrus in the parietal lobe? Which one's in the parietal lobe? Yeah, exactly. So several of us have, have mentioned correctly that we find the post central gyrus in the parietal lobe, the post central gyrus. Post means after. And when we talk about the post central gyrus, it's the bump that's after the central sulcus. And you can see this dark line right here. That's my, my central sulcus, which means that my bump right in front of it then is my pre central gyrus, my pre central gyrus. These bumps here in lecture are going to be important for us because if you remember that picture I showed you, the homunculi that were, were up on the wall there, that's where I find them, is inside these two bumps here. So I've got a pre-central gyrus and a post-central gyrus. Which one of these do we remember from, from our matching on the, the next page? Is it the pre-central gyrus or the post-central gyrus? Who's got the motor map in it or the motor area of, of the brain? Yeah, exactly. So several of us are mentioning the pre-central gyrus is where I have motor functions going on. I think we mentioned this in lab, but remember that the frontal lobe is where all of the motor type activities happen. Everything that is behind the central sulcus is going to be sensory activities. So starting first with our post-central gyrus, where we have our primary somatosensory area, where all of my general sensory information goes. And then I've got lots of other places in these other lobes here that help me to, to do other sensory type functions. Hey, before I move on to our next slide, there is one other lobe of the cerebrum we can't see that one on the outside. Yeah, exactly. So if I dove deep underneath my, my lobes, kind of right here where all three of them meet, we would also have a lobe hiding kind of here in the middle called the insula, the insula. Remember for lab, that was one that we never really ask you to label. We maybe ask you to label it once. Um, but the big thing for us to know about the insula, especially since we can't see it very easily, is that this is the one that helps us out with the process of taste. So the inner deep lobe in the brain, the insula, that one helps you out with taste. My temporal lobe over here helps us with hearing and smell. Process of vision back here in the occipital lobe. So let's go to our, our matching that we had on here. We've already talked about a lot of these things, so let me match up. I'll draw some lines for us here with what we literally just talked about. We just talked about who does vision. What was the lobe of the brain that does vision? Who was that one? Yeah, exactly. The occipital lobe was my vision lobe, absolutely. Uh, we just talked about who does hearing. Who does hearing? What lobe is that that does hearing? Yep, so hearing was the temporal lobe. And remember, along with hearing, the temporal lobe also did smell. So the temporal lobe does smell and hearing. The primary thing we're learning for lab in terms of, of what a, this one structure does is equilibrium. Who did we say was equilibrium? 
What part of the brain did that? Yeah, exactly. Equilibrium was the cerebellum. So if you read that article about the woman who had no cerebellum, you'll find that she had some issues with, with balance and some of her motor coordination. Um, that's the job of the cerebellum. When we talk about the frontal lobe, two things that, that the frontal lobe does. One of the things that the frontal lobe does is it gives you your personality. So who you are, what you like, what you uh, don't like, some of that kind of stuff comes from the frontal lobe. Let's delete that. Try again. There we go. The other thing that the frontal lobe has is that primary motor area in the precentral gyrus uh, that's found in the frontal lobe. That's that primary motor area. The postcentral gyrus is where we have the primary sensory area. And that's what we find inside uh, the parietal lobe of the brain. So a quick lab-based review, if you will, of the different structures of the brain and some of their functions. This was a good overview for us and we'll kind of dive more into the functions of, of these parts. Before I move on, any questions about what we've done so far? Or give me a thumbs up if, if we're feeling good about it. By the way, for my friend who also has a pointer on right now, if you go up here and click over to the left where there's that little uh, pointer next to the hand, click on that one to the left and it'll make you disappear. Perfect. All right, well, we're gonna try to power through as much of lesson 11 as we can. If we don't finish it up today, we can do some stuff tomorrow. Uh, we'll just see where today takes us. Oh, you're totally fine, Audrey. It's not a big deal. <laughs> it's really okay. <laughs> All right, when we talk about the brain, we should be thinking kind of in four big picture regions. We're gonna start by talking about the part of the brain called the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is made of two halves, two hemispheres. That's where all those lobes are. That's where your personality is. That's where we do uh, hearing. That's where we do vision. That's in the cerebrum. In the very middle of the cerebrum, we have a part of the brain that as a group, we call these things the diencephalon. Let me type that for us. The diencephalon. That's the part of the brain in the very middle. So the diencephalon, uh, the biggest part of it is the area called the thalamus. But then we also have parts called the hypothalamus and the epithalamus, all of those in the very middle of, of the brain. Then we go down into the region called the brainstem. The brainstem is really the part of you uh, that's about sustaining life in the most basic terms. So this is where things like your heart rate, your breathing rate, some of your reflexes, they all come from the brainstem, very basic. Whereas I like to call it higher order functioning, that's what's going on up, up here, is it up here in the cerebrum. And then obviously we've got that cerebellum as well, the last part of the brain. Uh, I, I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again, the cerebellum actually has the same number of neurons in it as the cerebrum does, they're just squeezed together way, way closer, which is why the cerebellum has, has little bumps that are so much smaller and so many more of them because there's tons and tons of neurons here in the cerebellum. If we take your cerebrum and we make a coronal plane, so we slice through it in a coronal plane, we can see inside the middle of the cerebrum. So inside the middle of the cerebrum, we can see how we've got gray matter on the outside that doesn't look quite gray, right? We were talking about this yesterday in lab. Gray matter toward the outside and then white matter for the most part that fills up the middle. There are some places in the very middle of the cerebrum uh, where we still see some gray matter. We have a special set of gray matter and those are places called the basal nuclei. I want you to underline, highlight, star this in your notes packet. Please make sure that we know that the basal nuclei 
are the special groups of gray matter in the very middle of the cerebrum. Everything in the middle is white except for the basal nuclei. And those are made out of gray matter. So you can see these gray matter spots that are in the middle of the cerebrum. Everything else in the middle is white. Gray matter otherwise always lives on the very outside of the brain. When we talk about gray matter versus white matter, it all comes down to anatomy. So when we look at the gray matter of the brain, we're going to see different parts of a neuron that live in the gray matter than the parts of the neuron that live in the white matter. Some of the parts of the neuron that live in the gray matter, the, the emphasis here being on my first one, the cell bodies of our neurons, the cell bodies of our neurons. Can you help me out in the chat? What are some of the things that the cell body of a neuron can do? What's the cell body of a neuron really good at? Okay, I like it. So it's really good at receiving. It's really good at processing those messages it receives. It takes information in. Yeah, that's perfect. When we talk about the gray matter of the brain, this is going to be um, here to use our, our, our technical lab term for it here. This is going to be the place where I do integration, where I do processing or, or that thinking. The gray matter of the brain, the thinking part of the brain, if you will. The white matter of the brain, notice that primarily what we find there are myelinated axons. Myelinated axons. Can you remind me in the chat? When we talk about an axon that has myelin on it, what is myelin actually made out of? What is myelin? Do we remember? Yeah, exactly. Myelin is a fatty substance. Absolutely. It's uh, kind of like I, I included some little bit emojis here. This is for you, Kaylin, because you mentioned it'd be fun, right, to have some in there. Um, I picture Dr. Aulis wrapped up in a blanket. Myelin acts like an insulator. It is helping you stay warm. It's helping you in the case of, of our neurons with their axons. It's insulating the electrical signal. When we wrap the axon in myelin, that fatty substance, it allows my neuron to send messages really quickly. So by having all of these parts of my neuron with myelin on them in the white matter, what that tells me is these are the parts of the brain that send messages quickly. The white matter of the brain has a lot of myelin. Because it has myelin, it looks white. That's my insulation. That's gonna help me send messages quickly. My gray matter doesn't have a lot of myelin, very little myelin at all, actually. Think about those cell bodies. They never have myelin on them. Uh, we have some types of neurons that, that never have myelin, and they would be living in the gray matter too. If I've got the cell bodies especially, this is my parts of the neuron and my parts of the brain that do a lot of thinking. So when you're considering the anatomy and the physiology of the brain, the anatomy, we've got gray matter all over the outside and in these little things called basal nuclei. That's my anatomy. My physiology being because they have the cell bodies, these are the parts of your brain that do processing and that do thinking. The parts that have the white matter, they've got all that myelin, that's their anatomy, lots of myelin. Their physiology being this is how I send messages fast. Anatomy and physiology as we look at the cross section of the brain. Now, I can't vouch for sure that this is a real picture. I hope it is, but I found it on Pinterest. So take it as a grain of salt, right? Pinterest has some great things and some not so great things. This is what Dr. Aulis looks at on Pinterest. What this is showing us, uh, either this human brain or this model is showing us, is what's going on in the white matter of the brain. Yeah, so like Elapina mentioned, when we talk about the white matter of the brain, 
the white matter of the brain is arranged in things called tracks. Now, check this out. In our lab session yesterday, remember that we talked about how we also have tracks in the spinal cord. Now, technically, we use that fun word for them, right, when we're in the spinal cord. So here, I'll put it down at the bottom. Our fun word in the spinal cord, we call them funiculi. Uh, the word we're going to use in lecture is going to be tracks, but it's the same idea. When we're in white matter, the kind of matter that sends messages quickly, the kind of matter that has axons that are, are myelinated, we actually arrange these axons in certain ways to help us send messages quickly. When we're processing information in the brain, one of the ways we might need to send information is we might need to stay in the same hemisphere, the same half of the brain. So if you notice over here, see how there's some, some lines that are, are representing groups of neurons that are all traveling together? See how these lines seem to kind of go from one part of the brain to another part of the brain? Or we've got a little bit of that going on over here. We're in one hemisphere of the brain and we're going to another place in that same hemisphere. Those are what we call those association tracks. Association tracks. The emphasis with those is that we stay in the same half of the brain. So in a bit, we're going to talk about how we have uh, what's called the visual association area. The visual association area helps you to figure out what you're seeing. So an association tracks helps you to take what you're looking at and figure, figure it out. So we're going to have uh, association tracks that Stay, have information maybe from where you first hear it to processing what you're hearing or from where you first see it to figuring out what you're seeing. Association tracks, yeah, absolutely, like, like Fanchon said. Association tracks help us to make an association to figure out what's going on. So these are the kind of tracks that we leave information in the same hemisphere or the same half of the brain, association tracks. Next kind of tracks are what we call commissural tracks. Commissural tracks. Commissural tracks help us to take information from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So commissural tracks go from one side to the other side. Yeah, the biggest commissural tract, and this is an underlying highlight star we must know, is that structure from lab called the corpus callosum. 100%, you must know that that is an example of a commissural tract. The job of commissural tracts is to connect one hemisphere to the other. When information needs to go from the left side to the right side, commissural tracts help us to do that. We might not just need to process our information in the same hemisphere. We might not just need to send it from one side to the other side. We might actually need to send it out of the brain, or it might need to come from the body to the brain. When we're talking about this last kind of tracks, these are ones that actually leave the brain. And the ones that leave the brain are called projection tracks. So projection tracks leave the brain. This would be like if we tracked some of some of these lines here, if they went down through the brainstem and down into the body, that's what projection tracks look like. So we are projecting out of the brain down into the body to get those messages out. So three different ways that the white matter of the brain is arranged. One way that it's arranged are what we call association tracks if we're just sending information next door for processing or for associating, if you will. Another way that we, we arrange our white matter in the brain are these commissural tracks where we go from one side to the other side. And then finally, we have these projection tracks. When information needs to go from the brain out to the body, we would use a, a projection tract in the white matter to do that. Fun fact, 
If someone is suffering from seizures, one way that they address those seizures is they can actually do what's called a corpus colostomy. Corpus colostomy. This is when we actually cut the corpus callosum. We cut the corpus callosum. What, what would happen if we cut the corpus callosum? What's the job of the corpus callosum based on what kind of tract it is? Yeah, so, so Kira's talking about if we cut the corpus callosum, information doesn't go from one hemisphere to the other. We, we actually prevent that kind of communication. So the deal with seizures is that sometimes a person has a seizure because the left side of the brain tells their body to do one thing and the right side of their brain tells their body to do something else. So if the two sides of the brain are both sending conflicting messages, that can lead to a seizure. So a corpus callostomy is when we actually cut the corpus callosum and stop those conflicting messages from being sent. It is absolutely very serious. It's not something that we do all the time, and it can definitely give you issues uh, because a lot of the higher order thinking and processing and stuff that we do we need both sides of the brain for that. So it, it's kind of a last resort for very serious seizures, but it can stop conflicting information from the two hemispheres from going and, and causing, causing seizures. Um, Audrey asked if this is for someone, you'd use that for someone with a lot of seizures. Uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, I think it's kind of a last resort type thing. So if someone has really bad seizures and it's not responding to medication, and there's no other way to get them under control, I, I do think it's probably like a, a last resort type thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely, we would, we would need to weigh out costs and benefits, absolutely, to, 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 because you're doing a serious thing, right? We're, we're cutting off communication between our two halves, halves of the brain. Yeah, definitely, as, as the TV ads say, right? Talk to your doctor about... <laughs> A corpus callostomy. Let, let's not, right? Let's not talk to our doctor about that one. We'll take a pass. <laughs> one of the things that those association tracks help us to do, and even to some extent the commissural tracks help us to do, is they help us to um, perform higher level functions. So when you receive information, for example, we already talked about this one. When you see something with your eyes over here, that information needs to end up back here in your brain. Notice back here in the brain though, we can see that there's a couple of areas that are receiving the information. We, we receive our information in what's called a primary visual area. So the fact that, that you saw any light at all, that goes to our, our primary area over here. For us to be able to interpret it, we're probably gonna, gonna take in, involve the use of our visual association area right next door. So here's where information is first sent in the brain. I can tell that because when I'm looking at this picture of the brain, this is a, a scan that shows me what parts of the brain are being activated. I can see that two parts in my occipital lobe are lighting up. The way that, I, I, sorry, I should have backtracked this here. Like we mentioned in the chat, this is, this is called an fMRI, a functional MRI. Let me type that. Functional, I spelled that wrong, MRI. The way this works is a person is awake and we are looking at blood flow. We're looking at blood flow. So in areas on this picture that we see here with kind of orange and red, there's a lot of blood going to those areas, telling us that those areas are active. That part of your brain needs more oxygen and needs more glucose, so we send more blood there. The areas that are, are green, these are areas that aren't very active. We're really not using them to, to, do, to do much. 
So in the process of seeing, if you're laying in an fMRI machine and they show you a picture and they look at your brain, you'll have the part of your brain light up that is, is where visual information first goes from your eyeballs. And then we'll light up next door where we process what it is that we're seeing. So when we say that that vision happens, the occipital lobe, it's because when I look at this fMRI, when I look at this functional MRI, the part of my brain that's seeing things is back here in the occipital lobe. When we say that the temporal lobe helps us out with hearing, notice when someone's hearing something, they're listening to something, we're lighting up that temporal lobe really good. White is actually the, the lightest color that we can go, meaning there's a ton of blood flow focused right in this area here with, with hearing. I love this. When we look over here at, at the fMRI of someone who's thinking, so when you're studying, for example, or when you're in the shower, right, and you're, you're thinking about a complex problem that you're dealing with, I just love how many different parts of the brain are involved in that. So it involves a whole lot of that frontal lobe, which is where your personality and your reasoning skills came from. But you probably are also pulling some information from, this is probably part of our auditory association area or some of our, our auditory memories, what we've heard. We're using those to help us think. Maybe some of our um, feeling type memories, so textures, that, that kind of stuff. We're, we're feeling that information is coming in. All of it pours together into thinking or processing. So much of our brain used when we're thinking. Yeah, I, I love it. Audrey's like, is this why we get headaches when we do homework? Or I always like to say, this is why when you're doing your homework, like, you got to eat something, right? If you need an excuse to, to have a little piece of chocolate, here's your excuse right here. Thinking hard and working hard, man, we are burning the glucose. You know what doesn't burn glucose though? Right here. I love this, this right here. It takes a ton of brain power to think, not so much brain power to speak, right? So, so this is why we're supposed to think before we speak, right? Because there's just a very small localized part of our brain. Uh, there, there's actually an, a couple of areas. We, we've named them because they're so localized. There is uh, an area called Broca's area that helps you to actually make words uh, and say them correctly. In the opposite hemisphere of the brain, uh, there, there's another area that helps you to put emotion into what you're saying. So only one hemisphere of your brain, actually the, I believe it's the left hemisphere of your brain, controls the motor function of speaking. The right hemisphere of your brain in the same place helps you uh, to put emotion into your speech. So we've all had that, that one teacher, right? You come to class and they sound like this the whole time and you fall asleep in class, but it's not your fault. That's not Dr. Aulis, right? I hope. <laughs> the, the opposite side of the brain that makes your words puts emotion into your words too. So we use, use the part that makes our words and the part that puts emotions into our words. Still, that is a drop in the bucket compared to what we do when we're thinking, right? So I just, I just love that, you know, we use so much of our brain to think, not nearly as much of our brain to speak. Want to do kind of a fun activity with us here. One of the, the things that you're studying in your packet is the difference between a primary sensory area and an a sensory association area. So I did a web search for inventions that, that actually exist that you could buy. Uh, so I would like us to help each other here as we're looking at these inventions to see if we can figure out um, what they are <laughs> and, and what we might use them for. So yeah, Caitlin is already reacting to this one over here. Um, this one over here is, is a little frightening looking, right? If we don't know what it is. So I've got a head right here with a whole lot of knives coming out of this head. Yikes. What if, if, if I wasn't just a creepy person and this wasn't an actual head, which I promise it's not, 
Um, what is, is this practically speaking? What is invention number A, a fancy version of? What would, would a normal person call this if it wasn't shaped so funky? Yeah, so th this is like a typical knife holder, right? It's like a knife block. So you could go and buy a head-shaped knife block. I don't remember how much it was, I apologize, but it is available online, a knife block shaped like a head. Um, make sure that you put this knife block in your kitchen so that others can see it through your window so they can get really worried about you, right? If you're gonna have this knife block, the world needs to see this knife block. So here's a knife block over here that looks real creepy. We got, we got knives in the head, okay? Here's my second invention that we see right here. Can we, can we tell what, what this invention is here or what it might help us to do? Yeah, so several of us chiming in about this being a Snuggie. Um, actually, fun fact, um, this is what we call a slanket. A slanket is a knockoff Snuggie. So Snuggies were so wildly popular that they actually made a knockoff version called a slanket. Uh, what I like about the name Slanket is it helps me know that this is a blanket with sleeves, right? Blanket with sleeves. Yeah, so it looks a lot like the uh, the Myelin Chief picture I included, right? So uh, what might we use this this Slanket for? What would be the goal of, of the Slanket or if you can afford it, a Snuggie? What do you use those things for? Yeah, so we use it for warmth, for insulation but not just like a regular blanket, right? Like if I wanna be drinking my coffee, if I wanna be eating that pizza that I didn't finish during group work, right? I'm gonna need some sleeves on my blanket here. So my slanket is gonna give me a space for my arms to come out while I still stay nice and toasty and really happy. Look at how happy she is. So yeah, I love it. Being snuggled up with your hands being free. Absolutely, that would be the job of, of this here. Hey, check out this one up here. Fairly certain this is the invention that I need in my life. Invention C up here, what would this be used for? How might this be helpful? Invention C up here. Yeah, exactly. So invention C, I would be using this to uh, to clean the floor, to, to sweep, to get stuff, get stuff looking a lot better. My son is, is legit crawling everywhere. Um, so I really actually need this in my life, right? So as he crawls, he cleans the floor. It is perfect. And then, of course, there's Invention D down here. Gotta love this. What would we use Invention D to do? What's the purpose of this down here? Absolutely. This is going to help us cool stuff down, right? Got my noodles on here. I got my fan to cool it down. Yeah, this, this is an invention that I need in my life too, right? No more blowing on your own noodles. This will take care of it for you and, and, and make it better. Yeah, you can eat it now. That's right, eat it now. Here's how all these fun inventions relate to your primary visual area versus your visual association area. When we look at, at this picture right here, we see some things right away. We see a face, we see some knives, and then maybe we, we get a little bit confused. Like what in the world is this creepy thing? That's why we were putting it in the window, right? So that, so that our neighbors could see it and be like, what is that? The fact that we figured out that this was a knife block was because of our visual association area. We could put together the knife that we were seeing with the head that we were seeing to figure out what we were actually seeing. Same thing here when we're looking at, at this picture of our slanket. We saw what looked like a blanket. We saw some arms on it. We could tell what we would do with an invention like that. Or we could tell that this is going to help us to eat those, eat those noodles faster because it's going to, this fan that I can see and these noodles that I can see, oh, I can figure out the purpose of what I'm seeing. So interpreting what you see, that's the, the job of the visual association area. The primary visual area is just what you use to look at things, just to see things. Yeah, so Gerard was mentioning that it's kind of like the idea of, of anatomy versus physiology. I like that. Yeah, so your primary visual area, it's, it's just literally what's there. Your visual association area is how does it work? What's it doing? I got to figure out 
figure out the way that it works. So yeah, I really like that idea. Think about, about the primary visual area as your anatomy of vision and the visual association area as your physiology of, of vision. Absolutely. Hey, just for kicks and giggles, I would love to see which invention do we need? I'm gonna make us a, a quick multiple choice poll and we can all vote and see what we think we need in our life. All right, it should be popping up for you on your screen. If it didn't pop up for you down at the bottom, there's that raised hand. There's a graph right next door to it. If you click on that graph picture, go ahead and click the letter on that, that poll that lets me know which of these inventions you need in your life. So many good ones, right? I guess I should have made like a all of the above, right? <laughs> I want them all. If money were no object, right? You could have all the cool things in the world. That's, uh, that's what Amazon says, right? Amazon says money is no object. Look at all the cool things I've got. All right, three, two, one. Here we go. By overwhelming majority, we are fans of the slanket. I like it. Slanket would be a wonderful thing to have in our lives, especially if is it today or tomorrow that's going to rain all day. That would be a great day to curl up in a slanket. Or to study anatomy in your slanket. Like, come on, that's that's pretty perfect. The only problem, I, I know I saw someone in the chat say that I need C. Uh, the only problem with me having invention C is that my son would like scoot everything together in a pile on the floor and then he would eat it. He's in that stage of life. So C sounds like a really awesome invention for me, but alas, I'm pretty sure he would eat everything that he swept up. Well, that's true. Kaylin's like, then you wouldn't have to clean it up. So uh, that that is true. Maybe I should just let him eat all the dirt. Bill does <laughs> eat everything that's on the floor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Perfect. Oh yeah, Audrey, I, I like your idea, right? If if we if we were to continue online learning, we could all do do slankets together. That would be perfect. If anyone finds like an anatomy themed snuggie or slanket, let me know, because I am I'm totally on board with that. I would love a, uh, a an anatomy snuggie in my life. <laughs> all right, so that brings us to those creepy pictures that may or may not have weirded you out when you were working on this lesson. Uh, so I always joke when we're in person that I need to hang these pictures up on the wall in, in my home because I'm already a weird person, so why not? Um, so I don't know if you all noticed that I actually hung them on the wall in our virtual classroom today. <laughs> so I, I, I got took my chance to, to hang up these, these things on our, our wall today. So this is uh, what we call the primary somatosensory cortex or the way that you're going to, to see it referred to in the guided lesson. And what I would like you to learn it as is the sensory homunculus, the sensory homunculus. This homunculus word is really weird, right? It's not nearly as, as fun as funiculi. But this homunculus word, think of it as just meaning a map. So the sensory homunculus is a map of where the general sensory information from each of these parts of your body, where it's specifically sent on your post central gyrus. Now let's remind ourselves because that was the beginning of class. Remember that we said that the post central gyrus is behind the central sulcus and everything behind the central sulcus is sensory information. So here's a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If I tell you on the homework assignment or on the exam that we're looking at a structure in the post central gyrus, 100% of the time, you know that that's the sensory homunculus because everything behind that central sulcus is sensory. 
when we look at these body parts on the sensory homunculus, and they're in all of, all of their random places here, when you're looking at, at these body parts, this shows you if I feel something on my cheek, here's the, the spot on my sensory homunculus that the, the neurons are who feel that for me. That's a different spot than if I feel something on my chin. The neurons who, who perceive me feeling it on my chin are down here. And that's a different spot than the neurons that feel stuff on my thumb or that feel stuff on, on my shoulder or my neck. This tells you where you would find those neurons that help you to feel things in all of these different places. When we look at the sizes of, of the body parts here on the map, does this match the relative size on your body? So like the, the size of the foot compared to the size of the trunk, is that the same as it is on you? Is your foot this much larger than your trunk? <laughs> Yeah, I hope not, right? Maybe that's why you're taking an online class, right? If you look like our, our sensory homunculus. <laughs> the, the size of things on the homunculus, how much space they take up, it, it doesn't match their relative size on your body. So check out the biggest part of pretty much everyone's body being their trunk or being their long legs. Those are the biggest parts of your body size-wise but they're also really small on the homunculus. Look at how much space we see taken up by your fingers. On you, that's a relatively small part of your body. On the homunculus, it's really big. The size of a body part on the homunculus tells us how many neurons receive sensory information in those places. So if you have uh, these really large fingers, for example, the really large fingers tells us there's a ton of sensory neurons in this part of the body. Compare that to the size of the trunk. Not nearly as many sensory neurons here as we would see here. And again, you can see that the face is really large. That means that all of the different places on your face receive a lot of sensory information. I want to clarify when we see things like the eye or the nose or the tongue, this is what we call general sensory information, general sensory information. So this is things like touch, things like temperature, uh, texture, pain. This is not going to be things like what you see. Information that you see with your eyes, that goes to the occipital lobe. It's not going to be things like you smell. Remember, what we smell goes to the temporal lobe. Or what we taste, that's going to the insula. So when we see this map, the kinds of information that we send to the parietal lobe, to the sensory homunculus, that's this general sensory information. And if you have a big part or a big size on this map, I get a lot of information from you. If you have a little part on the map, I don't get very much information from you. What questions if we have any we can put to words, what questions do we have about the sensory homunculus? Is there any we can, can think of right now? Well, here's what I'll say. As you are working on the homework assignment, you'll see a lot of questions that say this part of the true or false. This part of the body gets more sensory information than a different part of the body. So um, let's let's do one together. True 
or false. The knee gets more sensory information than the fingers. True or false. The knee gets more sensory information than the fingers. Yeah, we're all correct. We're saying it's false. If you check out on, on my map over here, I've got my little region that the knee is, is represented by. So the neurons that live right here, they're going to collect information from the knee. Perfect. But look at all of the space on, on my brain that the fingers take up. The fingers get a lot of sensory information. Or we could do a question like, true or false, the foot collects more sensory information than the head. True or false, the foot collects more sensory information than the head. Ooh, we're divided. So when we're looking at our picture, the foot is this big, meaning I've got that many sensory neurons that are collecting information. The head collects this information right here. So I've got the head. I, I can see why I, I understand the confusion actually. Yep, the, you're totally right, Gerardo. I should have clarified we're not including the face. Face and the head different. So the head right here, just a little bit of information compared to the foot that collects a lot of information. The face has all kinds of different parts, right? And we collect a lot of information there. It's pretty tough to beat the amount of information from your face. <laughs> Maybe the hand and the fingers comes close, but the face really does receive a lot of sensory information. So as you're interpreting the, this, this picture, here's our important things to remember. Number one, this is the sensory homunculus. So this tells us the amount of sensory information that each of these parts of the body collect. Number two, I know that it's sensory because we're in the post-central gyrus. We're in the post-central gyrus. If we were in the pre-central gyrus, as we'll see in a moment, that's motor, but because I'm in the post-central gyrus, it's sensory. Third big idea to know, the larger the size of a body part on this homunculus, on this map in your brain, if the part is really big on here, that means that there's a lot of sensory information from there. If the part's really small, not as much information coming from there. So the larger you are, the more sensory neurons you have compared to some of these smaller parts that we see over here. Now let's compare the primary somatosensory cortex or what we're calling the sensory homunculus to the motor homunculus, the motor homunculus. This is still a map of the body, but this map is found in the precentral gyrus, the precentral gyrus, meaning that this is in the frontal lobe of the brain. This map looks a lot like the sensory homunculus did, but it's not quite the same. And it's not quite the same because this tells us nothing about sensory information anymore. This just tells me about the number of motor neurons that go to each place in the body. So motor neurons are the type of neurons that make actions happen. If I've got a lot of motor neurons going somewhere, so for example, those fingers, if I've got a lot of motor neurons that are going there, they can do a lot of different actions. Think about all the things you can do with your fingers. You can type, you can play the piano, you can twiddle uh, your thumbs, you can play with your hair. Fingers can do a lot of different things because there's so many different motor neurons that send them directions. 
Compare that to your toes. Our toes have this little tiny section on the motor homunculus, little tiny section, which is why pretty much all we can do to borrow some of our lab words are things like plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. I'm pretty sure that Kaylin was talking about the fingers poking someone, but you're not wrong that the toes could do that too. <laughs> or if you're very skilled, like, like Dr. Aulis, Dr. Aulis is very skilled here, uh, I will sometimes pick things up with my toes, uh, but that's only because I'm tall and I'm lazy. So <laughs> mostly I'm much better at picking things up with, with my fingers. Big idea here being, if you have a really large body part, you can do a lot of different things. If you have a really small body part, you can't do as many different things because there's not nearly as many motor neurons that are sending messages to those parts of the body, telling them what to do. Now, please know that on the exam, I promise you, I will not make you have this map memorized. Please do not waste time memorizing where the different body parts are on this map because I will give you this picture. I may or may not have it labeled exactly like this. I will either tell you which lobe of the brain it's in. So is it in the frontal lobe or the parietal lobe? I may tell you what gyrus it's in. So if it's in the precentral gyrus or the postcentral gyrus, or I might tell you straight up, it's the motor homunculus or the sensory homunculus. I care that you can explain what this means. And there are lots of practice questions on the homework assignment related to this and back again on the review assignment. So please make sure you're trying those questions on the homework assignments related to the homunculi so that you have an idea of the kinds of questions to ask tomorrow if there, there's still some things we're, we're processing about it. Yeah, Fanchon, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just going to ask it here because I'm just trying to make sure I'm making this connection correctly. So going back to when we had just the pictures of the neurons where we had the little sensory neuron and then we showed it go into the inner neuron and then out through the motor neuron. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in thinking so that like, for instance, when you see a picture, you, that stimuli goes up to the sensory homunculus and then into the inner neuron, whatever, and then it goes out kind of to the primary motor. Is, is that kind of what is happening there? Yeah, so that's a great connection to make. And we will, um, when we start talking about the spinal cord, we're going to talk about the special kinds of tracks that help us to do that. So say you feel something with your finger, there would be a sensory neuron in your finger that goes all the way up through the spinal cord, all the way up to the part of the brain called the thalamus. The thalamus, as we'll talk about more soon, um, the thalamus will sort it or send that information to the right place in the sensory homunculus. Once that information is in the sensory homunculus, it, when your brain processes it in what we would call the somatosensory association area, so figures out what to do with it, that interneuron would then swing next door, so it would go through an association tract over here to our motor cortex to tell our, our fingers what they should do. And then that information would, would go back down to the motor neurons in your finger. So yeah, there, there's more neurons involved than our little reflex arc showed us, but it's, it's absolutely the same idea, definitely. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I see a couple of questions about the exam in the chat. Yeah, the exam is going to cover 9, 10, and 11. So this is, is number 11, our last one here. Um, not totally sure on the number of questions that are on the exam. Uh, I want to say it's in the ballpark maybe of 50 to 60, but I don't remember the exact number. I apologize. It's about, about standard. Um, number 
on the exam. Yeah. So I think you've seen this picture before in um, the guided lesson. This is what you would look like if the, the size of your body parts on the homunculus were the, the actual size on you. So when we're talking about the, uh, the size of the hands, for example, and, and things like the face, there's a lot of sensory information that we collect in those regions. If it was accurate to scale with the other parts of your body uh, that on you as a person are much larger, but they just don't have as many uh, sensory neurons, this is about what you would look like if you were built based on the sensory homunculus. I love this one. Look at how happy this one looks and really creepy at the same time. This one is the motor homunculus. What you would look like if, if you were made the way that your motor homunculus looks. So I include these pictures just to mention that the number of sensory and motor neurons that we have uh, do not match the size of things on our actual body. Uh, just because a, a body part like your trunk is really big, um, it doesn't mean that you've got a lot of sensory information coming from there or a lot of motor information. There's only so many things we can do with our trunk. We can do all the things with our hands, though. Yeah, I love the comment in the chat. This would, would also be a great knife block holder. Yeah, I, I think I need to get these and I need to get that knife block and put them in my home office. Uh, I've got some really great windows in my home office. So make sure to leave my blinds open. Uh, make sure to leave all of my anatomy stru stru uh, structures all out for the world to see. Just in case they didn't think I was weird enough, 100%. <laughs> yeah, or a wine bottle holder. I love it. Yeah, th there's like space right here to hold a bottle of wine. That would, would be a great, uh, a great use for this. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, briefly, uh, briefly mention the cerebellum. Remember from lab, we have that structure called the arbor vitae, the tree of life. So the arbor vitae is the white matter inside the cerebellum. The gray matter on the outside is called the folia, and it's folded up really tightly to make space for lots of different neurons here. We're not studying a lot about the cerebellum, except to say that the cerebellum is very easily influenced by alcohol. So when you're having fun at the end of the semester that Dr. Aulis is having no part of, <laughs> make sure we're not planning to drink and drive because the cerebellum is one of the things that helps us to drive correctly and if we drink too much, our cerebellum's not going to be doing its job correctly. So if an officer suspects that you've been drinking and driving, they might ask you to do the roadside sobriety test, the roadside sobriety test like we see in our picture here. What are some of the things that they make you do in the roadside sobriety test? What are some of the things we see on TV that they make people do? We'll, we'll phrase it that way. Yeah, walking a straight line. Yep, taking a walk. Yeah, saying the ABCs backwards, touching your nose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, following the light. Yeah, so when we when we talk about the kinds of things that they make us do, yeah, several of us are, are mentioning in the chat, and if we were in person, I would show you I can't walk a straight line either. It's very hard for me, even though I promise that I don't day drink. I can't drop, walk a straight line very easily without swaying all over the place. The cerebellum helps us uh, to look at the actions that we're doing and send out any corrections that need to be made. So in walking a straight line, you're supposed to put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, we're supposed to not fall over, right? Those are the directions that your cerebrum, that your brain is sending to you. You're trying to walk in a straight line. Now, if you start veering off to the side over here, if we're doing some really awesome dance moves and we start to fall over, our cerebellum is supposed to send out corrections to make sure we're doing our, our walking or our dancing correctly. But if the cerebellum is impaired by alcohol, we can't send out those corrections. We can't do that. 
So a lot of the things that they have you do on a roadside sobriety test are to check to see if you're still getting those directions to make sure you do things correctly. I kind of like to joke with students that the goal of the cerebellum is to make you not look funny. So to make you walk correctly, to make you dance correctly, to make you do whatever correctly. But if your cerebellum's not working, you look like a drunk person. Yeah, there are a couple of us, us mentioning that it's pretty funny that he thought taking off his flip-flops was going to help him. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> so your cerebellum essentially makes you not look funny when you're doing stuff. If you've been drinking, you're probably going to look funny. You're probably going to act funny. And you just might get caught. So have your safe fun with alcohol. But don't be driving because that cerebellum is, is not not working. I'll mention too, by the way, um, one of the cool things about the way the cerebellum works is uh, sometimes you mentioned they told you to touch your nose in a roadside sobriety test. Usually they'll tell you to touch your nose with your eyes closed because your cerebellum is supposed to know where the parts of your face are without you seeing it. So if we close our eyes, theoretically, we should still be able to find our nose. If we're a little tipsy, we might not be able to find our nose. So uh, another reason they have you do, do things like that where you close your eyes, um, they have you go from finger to finger on your nose because you should be able to do that because your cerebellum knows where it is. So roadside sobriety test, a great example for us of what happens when the cerebellum is not working. <laughs> Kaylin says her cerebellum's on point today. Nice. Props to the cerebellum. Keep up the good work. <laughs> so the cerebellum makes us do movements uh, in, in ways that don't look fun funky. Uh, yeah, Elephine is asking if, if the cerebellum has to do with the fluid that we find in the ear. Um, yeah, so the cerebellum is actually going to use information from your ear to figure out if you're falling over. So yes, that, that fluid that we'll talk about in, in our very last lecture chapter, looking at how it's moving, that helps your cerebellum know if we're falling over or not. So goal of, of the cerebellum, help you to not fall over using input from your ears. Um, feeling what's going on with your muscles makes them do things correctly. That's the job of the cerebellum, smooth things out, make you do stuff right. When we talk about the basal nuclei, that special gray matter that was in the very middle of the brain, that does something slightly different when it comes to movement. The goal of the basal nuclei, so basal nuclei, their goal is to stop unwanted movements. Stop unwanted movements. So the best way to see what, what we mean by unwanted movements uh, is to look at conditions where the basal nuclei aren't working. So one of those conditions is Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, the unwanted movements are called tremors. So we never stop sending these little messages out to the hands or the feet or to the head, uh, telling those parts of the body not to shake. So tremors are kind of... Uh, repeated short movements that we can't stop because the basal nuclei aren't stopping that message. You can have things like tremors. You can also have things that are called ticks. Ticks are a lot more short lasting than a tremor. Um, ticks are what we see in what's called Tourette's syndrome. So in this particular picture, we're looking at, at what's called a, a, um, a facial tick. Uh, so a facial tick or a motor tick, the, this boy, his face is randomly a, a facial expression is flashing across it. Uh, or you can have what are called vocal ticks, where someone will randomly make a noise. It, it's something that you would not normally want to do, but you don't have the basal nuclei stopping that message. Yeah, Kaylin's, Kaylin's totally right. Uh, this is something that we see with, with patients who have autism. Yeah, and, and TN, you're correct, actually. The, the disorder we're talking about is called Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome. So when we see vocal tics, when we see motor tics, uh, it can be um, a movement like a facial expression. 
It could be um, like an arm jerking really fast or a leg jerking really fast, or it can be some kind of noise that's made. Uh, things, again, that you would normally stop. We wouldn't normally do this action, but when the basal nuclei aren't working, now we do that. Or when the basal nuclei aren't working, as we see here in, in Parkinson's, we can also have these, um, uh, these tremors that are more repeated movements that won't stop. Yeah, and, and Temi Teo mentioned the, the other kind of tick that, that we mentioned in the guided lesson for you um, can also be kind of like emotional ticks. Um, so the way that, that you feel, a lot of times we are, are modulating what we're showing to people, right? Uh, but, but someone with Tourette's syndrome may just burst into tears, unwanted. They, they may just start crying. Um, so that's the kind, of, the kind of things that maybe you normally would control. With Tourette's syndrome, without those basal nuclei, it's a lot harder to do that. <laughs> yeah, so so Kaylin's saying a child could could claim Tourette's syndrome, right? Hit their sibling and say, oh, I didn't, I couldn't help it. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> they could, but now you can see through their lie, right? You're like, I don't think so. That's, that's not quite how the basal nuclei work. <laughs> yeah, my muscle made me do it, right? <laughs> I like that. We talked about emotional uh, tics where someone kind of just bursts into tears. Uh, let's talk about some other emotional type stuff in the brain. Uh, when we talk about emotional stuff in the brain, we are talking about the limbic system. Uh, so the limbic system, there are three structures that I want you to be familiar with. The first structure I want you to be familiar with is what's going on, freaking out in this cat over here. Uh, so this cat is showing us what's called the rage response. The rage response in cats is when they are hissing at you and they are spitting and baring their teeth at you. This is what we see in a cat when their amygdaloid body is activated uh, or in, in easy, easy terms, we just would call it the amygdala. Uh, this is the part of your brain that's responsible for rage responses. Interestingly, this is um, another, uh, so another thing that the amygdaloid body helps us out with is also a fear response. Uh, so fear is a protective response. When we see fear on the face of others, we know that maybe something's up and we might need to be on edge. So the goal of the amygdala is to keep you safe. Uh, a lot of times they talk about what's called fight or flight responses. You'll talk about that um, probably a little bit more in AMP2. Fight or flight. You're in a dangerous situation. Either we need to get angry, we need to fight off something that's going wrong, or we need to get scared. We need to flee. Um, that The amygdala is really important in those fight or flight responses to keep you safe. An interesting fact about the amygdala is if it's damaged, not only do you not feel things like fear, uh, but you also can't see fear on the face of other people. So if someone around you or lots of people around you are scared and their face is showing that, without your amygdala, you can't interpret that emotion. You don't know what's going on. So the amygdala not only helps us to have emotions, but it also helps us to read the emotions of other people, the, the amygdala or the amygdaloid body fear and rage, and then reading those kinds of responses in others. Another important uh, structure in our limbic system, our emotional brain, that's call, called the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb. Uh, there was a little bit of talk of this yesterday. I, I don't know if I quite addressed it. The olfactory bulb is actually part of the olfactory nerve. So it's just the very end of the olfactory nerve. Uh, so they're basically one and the same uh, when you're looking at, at the terminology there. The olfactory bulb is what allows you to have an emotional response to what you're smelling. So maybe there's a certain kind of cookies that your mom always made and you smell them and it takes you back to your childhood. Uh, or, or maybe there's a certain perfume that always reminds you of, of your partner or of your ex-partner. <laughs> If it reminds you of your partner, as long as it's, it's a good relationship, right, that'll make you feel happy. If it reminds you of your ex, might make you cry or make you really, really mad, right? Might, might activate that amygdaloid body. <laughs> so the olfactory bulb 
it gives you what I like to say is an emotional response to smells. You smell something and it takes you back to, to something that, that happened to you. The other part of the limbic system we're talking about is a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus. How many of us know this, where this picture came from? I know I saw that, that Kaylin knows where this came from. Okay, Temi Tao knows about it too. So awesome, good. Lots of us have seen the movie Inside Out. Um, Inside Out is a really fun movie. My daughter loves it. Um, and it, it's actually not entirely inaccurate. I was, I was actually kind of pleased with, with the way that they did it from an anatomy perspective. So what we are looking at right here is two of the emotions in the brain, joy and sadness, and they're out in long-term memory. Uh, so all of these little balls are memories that are, are in this girl's brain. Um, when we talk about memories, we've got long-term and short-term memories, but we also have this part of our brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the part of our brain that helps us to make memories. A cool thing about the hippocampus is this is the one part of your brain where the neurons are always doing mitosis. The hippocampus is where neurons always do mitosis. What is it that happens in mitosis? What does mitosis mean? Yeah, exactly. So Audrey mentioned new cells being made or Temi says division of our cells. Yeah. So the hippocampus is the one part of the brain where we are always making new neurons. For the most part, what you have when you hit about age 20, that is all you're going to get. Your neurons stop dividing. The adult brain is the adult brain everywhere except the hippocampus. You can always make new neurons in the hippocampus, which means you can always make new memories. Isn't that cool? We're always building new neurons in the part of our brain where we store memories. So no matter how old you are, you can always learn new things. You can always store new information because the hippocampus is always making new neurons. Memories, by the way, are just synapses. They're connection points between neurons. So as long as we keep building new neurons, we can always make new connections. We can always make new, new memories. We've got the exam coming up, right? So we are very interested right now in making some memories. We want to, uh, to, to get some stuff to stick in our mind. So let's talk about the way that your mind makes memories. Full disclosure, I'm about 95% certain that the reason they asked me to cover this topic with you all is to improve your study skills. So this is like on the district syllabus. One of the things we're supposed to talk about is how memories are formed. Okay, so you want me to teach my students how to study. I can do this. <laughs> so let's talk about how to effectively study, how to make, make some memories. All of our memories start with some kind of stimuli, some kind of outside information. That information, as, as soon as you encounter it, is sent into temporary storage. Now, when we say temporary storage, this is, is just kind of floating around on its way to your brain. Sometimes when you receive stimuli, uh, that information, your brain is like, oh, that's not important. I'm just gonna, it's gonna permanently lose it right away. We don't need to remember this at all. Some of that information though is, is as it says here, selected to be transferred to your short-term memory. Now here's the deal with short-term memory. Short-term memory is good in the short term, meaning it's not long lasting, long enough basically for you to use it and then lose it. I like to tell all my students that when I was in high school, I was a sandwich artist, or that's a fancy word for saying I worked at Subway, but I was a sandwich artist. That was my job resume said I was a sandwich artist. My short-term memory worked just long enough for you to tell me what size sandwich you wanted, what kind of bread you wanted, what kind of meat you wanted. That was my short-term memory. 
short-term memory has space for about seven facts. Uh, think about a typical phone number. That would be 10 numbers. So there's not even almost enough space for you to store a phone number in short-term memory. Short-term memory is going to be forgotten unless we can train our brain to make it long-term memory. So here's what studying first makes for you, short-term memories. Okay, that's awesome. Use it and lose it. Short-term memory, space for seven facts. I promise you that there are more than seven facts on your exam. We can't just do short-term memory and make it on the exam, right? We gotta get some stuff up here to long-term memory. Long-term memory has more than enough space. So how do we get stuff from short-term memory, those seven facts, how do we make them stick? Well, one of the ways that we make them stick is by rehearsing them. This is why I literally tell you, talk with your neighbors or talk with your family uh, or, or talk with each other in the group me. The more you practice what you've learned or what you know, the more likely it is to stick. The more we can attach this new stuff to old stuff, the more it's likely it is to, to stick. This is why almost every lecture, today's gonna be an exception, but almost every lecture, we go back to that stupid salty banana, right? It won't leave us alone. But the more that we can attach to that salty banana, the more we're gonna remember. So the more you can attach things together, stuff that's already long-term to your new-term stuff, that's gonna help you. And then of course, it also helps if we're excited, right? So if we're enjoying what we're learning, if we're hearing it in an environment that doesn't completely bore us to death, that's gonna help us as well to make things into long-term memory. Essentially, one of the, the best ways with this excitement thing here, one of the best ways for you to get from short-term to long-term is being emotionally invested. So whether we are happy, uh, whether we are sad to some extent, um, that's, that's not ideal, but some of the strongest long-term memories you make will be memories that you make in a highly emotional state. So things that happened in your childhood, things that happened in your adulthood, um, those are very influenced by, by emotions. When we talk about long-term memory, long-term memory is not necessarily permanent memory. It is longer lasting, but we have to keep accessing it. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to get to it. So I, I mentioned that we store information in synapses, in connections. If we don't keep using those connections, eventually those neurons will undergo, it's called pruning, uh, where we just don't connect them to each other anymore. So either that information will be there, but I can't get to it, or I've completely lost it. So the more we can keep using our information, the more that, that we can keep associating things and, and pulling them together, the more likely we are to get those long-term memories. So long-term memories, here's some of your, your study tips. How can I make that little stuff I'm studying last me long-term? Again, this is why, I know someone mentioned this in the chat, this right here is why cramming for an exam doesn't work. You've got space for seven facts. You can cram seven things. That's awesome. But again, we need more than seven things. We, the best way, it's not fast, but the best way to get that information to transfer, rehearse, 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 practice. Do it over and over again. I like it. Audrey said one of, one of the ways that, that she ran through her, her muscle contraction stuff was by relating it to a leg cramp she was having. That's perfect. Yeah, so associating some of that new stuff that we learned <laughs> or that, that we're, we're feeling, attach that to some of the stuff we experienced. Absolutely. For you to be able to learn things, you have to be alert. You have to be excited, ideally. Uh, and, and the way that we keep our brain alert and awake and ready to learn stuff is using something called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system. Yeah, I'm just gonna call it RAS, R-A-S, because that's way shorter and easier to say. 
So RAS is the reticular activating system. This is not something that I can just draw on one place in the brain because it kind of goes everywhere. The, the job of RAS, the reticular activating system, is to keep your brain alert and ready to receive messages. So the way that RAS works is it collects information from, from various parts of, of your body. So for example, it's collecting visual information, things that you see. So is it light outside or is it dark outside? If it's light outside, we're gonna collect a lot of information through, through the visual pathway to feed into the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system listens for auditory information. So are we hearing an alarm go off, for example, to wake us up from being asleep? Are we hearing our teacher talking? Are we hearing the TV in the background? Auditory impulses also go into this system to, to make it activated. Other kinds of information can also go in, things like touch. So uh, if you've ever had like a rubber band on your wrist and you kind of pull on it and let it go, pull on it and let it go, that kind of touch sensation or pain, uh, temperature, like cold air blowing on your face, all of those kinds of sensory information go into the reticular activating system. That information then is sent to kind of the central part of the brain where there are lots of different neurons that activate the cerebrum. So remember that the cerebrum is the part of your brain that does the thinking and the processing. Think about the reticular activating system as essentially just sending out little pings so like a submarine sends out pings to figure out what's going on in its environment, the reticular activating system sends out all of these little pings to the parts of the brain to make sure that the brain is alert and that it's awake. You have to be alert and awake to be able to receive new information. Now, I always like to joke that the reticular activating system is the thing that you could be cursing when it's three in the morning and you can't fall asleep. This is the thing that's keeping you awake because you hear a clock ticking or because you see a blue light somewhere in the hallway, uh, because it's too hot in your bedroom. So you can blame your reticular activating system when you are wide awake and you can't fall asleep. The reticular activating system is what we use to wake up. So when you're sleeping, we turn the reticular activating system off. It's no, not functioning so that your cerebrum can sleep. When we can't turn it back on, when it's been damaged or permanently deactivated, we would say that a person is in a coma. So you can be hearing things, feeling things, but if you can't wake up, if we can't become conscious again, that's an issue with the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system keeps the cerebrum awake, keeps it alert. This is what we use to wake up and to stay awake. The reticular activating system, by the way, is what we're trying to activate with smoke detectors. Smoke detectors make really loud noises a lot of times smoke detectors flash lights to help to activate the reticular activating system to help you know your house is on fire. If you were awake and your house was on fire, what would be the first way you would know that your house was on fire if you were, if you were awake? Yeah, absolutely. If you were awake, you would smell the smoke, right? Notice that smell does not feed into the reticular activating system. So smelling things doesn't make your mind automatically turn on. So this is why we have smoke detectors, to make sure that we have some kinds of input that, that feed into this system to wake us up. Yeah, so Kaylin mentions feeling hot. You'd feel the temperature rise. If you are asleep, and you're feeling the temperature rise, you're absolutely right. It's probably too late. If the fire is, is in your room and, and you're getting burned, it's too late to get out. 
So the kinds of, of things that feed into this system, if the fire itself is tripping these kinds of things, it's too late to get out. Smoke detectors help us to get out in time by using some impulses that, that are strong enough to wake us up, strong enough to get us out in time, absolutely. So the opposite side of the coin from the reticular activating system uh, is a structure called the pineal gland. The pineal gland. So the pineal gland is responsible for what we call your circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms. This is your sleep-wake cycle. So when you feel sleepy versus when you wake up, it's supposed to be on a rhythm. It's supposed to match the sun. We are to the point in the semester, though, that we're like this, right? Especially with e-learning. This is particularly uh, poignant with e-learning, right? Falling asleep at the laptop, at least yawning, wanting some more coffee, right? Perhaps your pineal gland is telling you that it's time to sleep, even though it's not supposed to. The way that the pineal gland tells you to sleep is it makes melatonin. Makes melatonin. Melatonin, like the supplement that you can buy at the grocery store to make you go to sleep, your pineal gland is the normal source of melatonin. When your pineal gland makes melatonin at the wrong time of day, like when you're supposed to be studying, uh, or when your pineal gland is synced up to another time zone, like if you were to travel overseas, yeah, you can, can fall into what's called jet lag. So jet lag is when the pineal gland makes melatonin at the wrong time of day. The best way for us to treat jet lag when we make melatonin at the wrong time of day is what we call bright light therapy. And literally its name tells you how it works. Bright light therapy. We sit in front of a bright light that's supposed to imitate the sun and it brings us great joy. Look at how happy she is. She's just loving her bright light. Actually what bright light therapy does is it kind of kicks the pineal gland and says, hey, wake up. It is daytime right now. It is not the time to make melatonin. So bright light therapy can be used to, to offset jet lag. This is why they, they often say stay awake in the time zone that you're, you're back home in. Stay awake in that time zone until it's bedtime to try to reset the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is light sensitive Corollary to this, by the way, um, the kind of light that most has an effect on the pineal gland is like blue light, blue purple light. Blue light, you've probably heard about a lot uh, as what is emitted by TVs and cell phones. So back in the day, like, you know, 100 years ago, before all the technology we have now, the only time your brain saw blue light was when the sun was out. Well, now we have devices that put off blue light at all hours of the night, like when we're supposed to be sleeping. And our pineal gland says, oh, it's time to be awake. It's not time to spit out melatonin. So the pineal gland is very light sensitive in that regard. If we are shining blue light at it all hours of the night, it's going to get real confused and not know when to make melatonin. So the pineal gland, important for regulating our sleep-wake cycles relies a lot on light to know when it should be making melatonin. Let me see. Yeah, so I think I'm going to call that it for today. We have left a discussion of the thalamus, of the brain stem, and the brain blood vessels. So tomorrow, the very first thing we'll do is we'll chat through that, and then we will start reviewing for exam number three. Before I turn off our recording, are there any last minute questions about the content we covered today? Shoot me an emoji. Where, what are we uh, thinking and feeling? or what emoji looks cool to you. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recording. Again, we will uh, 
pick up where we left off tomorrow at one o'clock. We'll wrap this up and we will start our review for exam number three.